everybody, welcome to Hours Played, a podcast for couples looking for the perfect cooperative game. Each episode we explore new and nostalgic games to help you pick out what to play on game night. Today we are unplugged as we break out a board game to cover. If you are joining us for the first time, my name is Rob. And my name is Bailey. And we are going to talk about a game today called The Big Book of Madness. So what's the deal? What's Big Book of Madness about? Big Book of Madness, and this was a special one to us because it might be one of the first cooperative board games that we have done, but Big Book of Madness, it was released in um, 2015, and it is a, as I mentioned, cooperative board game, hence the unpluggedness this time, um, developed by Yellow, we think we're pronouncing that right, I-E-L-L-O. That's how I would pronounce it. Their logo is also yellow, the color, so that's the guess that we're going to be going with. And it is a cooperative deck building game that also has some hand management strategy in it as well. And there are some varying character abilities within this. So you do have some opportunity to collect and build your deck, um, change the character that you want to um, play each time. So there's some strategy inherent in that as well. There is a recent expansion to this game. We've been playing this for years and have been hoping and praying for an expansion to come. And it did in the last few months. We will not be covering that today since we're much more familiar with the base game, but looking forward to uh, getting more experience with that as well. Yeah, we, we've played it with the expansion only a, a handful of times at this point, and we've seen it, it adds a good level of difficulty, so I'm excited to really dive into it more and try and figure out what the optimal strategies are and how they've changed with some of the new content, but definitely not practice enough to cover it today. Okay, why don't we jump right in and cover some of the basic mechanics of the game. So why don't you set the scene? What is like the premise of the game? Absolutely. So you and your fellow players are students in the elementary college, um, uh, not elementary, elementary, to, say, to connect with the four elements that you use throughout the game, um, earth, water, fire, air and wind, I think, or air or wind. Um, and so you are students who have unwittingly opened up the big book of madness, which has monsters trapped within it. Once they are open, they are running amok throughout your magic school and you and your peers need to come to work together to solve little puzzles to put the monsters back in the book yeah, and, without it, losing your mind. It invokes a like forbidden section of Harry Potter kind of vibe Absolutely. with a little bit more teen angst, which I know the later movies get a little bit more angsty, but it's very the character designs are very like emo haircuts and colorful clothing and that kind of stuff. So <laughs> um so the goal of the game, I think, as you mentioned, is to fight off all the monsters that are coming out of this book. And the way that you do that, unlike a lot of other games, it's not really combat. It's uh, much more of an abstraction is how you deal with them. So when a monster spawns, which you actually do by turning a book that you create at the beginning of the game, which is kind of a cool little bit of flavor. But when that monster comes in, that monster card will tell you uh, three different curses to put on the board. The board has room for five curses. So in the beginning of the game, you are only placing three. Later in the game, that'll change. Each curse corresponds to one of the elements, and you have to, from decks or from cards that you have in your hand, you have to match four cards of that element or four value of that element to clear a curse. Curses are bad because on each player's turn, you have to move forward one space on the board, and if there's a curse on that spot on the board, then you have to take the negative effect of that curse. So sometimes they're a little mundane, like one player has to get rid of a card from their deck, or you have to add a dead card to your deck. Um, sometimes they're really bad, like making every other curse in the round more difficult. Generally, you want to try to cure all the curses when you can. There's a little variation in that strategy, uh, which we'll talk about later. Um, and if you do manage to cure all of the curses in a round, you get a positive effect for the team. And if you don't manage to cure them all, you have to take a penalty for the team. So the hand management really comes in the, the match four system. So based on what you have in your hand and what other players around the table have in their hands, that's where you're drawing cards from to make your match four. So even if I, as the current player, don't have all four element cards to cure a curse, the game has systems to share cards and share actions on your turn with other players. So I know one of the, the big things that we need to cover is spells. Each character starts with four spells. Do you remember what those are? Ice, which allows you to put cards in a, a shared space that anyone else at the table can use that card. Combustion, yep. which allows you to 
destroy a card, so remove it from the game. Growth is to cycle your deck, and telepathy, um, give one action to another player or a multiplier of number of actions for one player. And each of those four spells corresponds to one of those four elements. Yep, so you have to spend element cards from your hand to cast that spell and work as a team to find the match four that you need. So sometimes it's worth it spending a card, even if you need it, so that you can get access to other cards in, in other players' hands. And as you mentioned, some of the, the spells are variable. So depending on how many element cards you spend on them, you get a better effect. So there's a, a nice kind of built-in risk reward system there which works really well to start the game you have to choose characters from a pool of eight characters and i think over the years we've definitely found that there's some balancing that needs to be done yeah for the characters i know there's one character in the box that we basically never played and one that we try to use every time because he's just that good yeah so each character kind of has their own power built in and like you said some of them just seem so out of tune with the other characters in the game that basically if you're playing with a certain number of people, you're always going to include the same characters. So that's not really ideal. It's I think there's... We'll give you an example. Uh, the one that we're often playing with basically has a wild card mechanic. He can treat in his turn any one air as a one of any element. Is that yeah. right? Yep. So, I mean, having a wild card when you only have so many cards in your hand is just really powerful compared to a character who their ability is like draw one card and if, if it's, it's a madness, then draw it again so it's just the opportunity to use that power does not come up and it's not as helpful all as often as the other one is yeah so it's def uh, definitely a drawback that you can't get as much character variety as maybe you you would like i know the expansion has added some new characters so maybe that changes some things but uh a little bit of a drawback so anyway you start by building your team you can have up to to five people playing at a time so you might have five characters mixed in there and from there you build your starting deck each character has a predetermined number of cards and variety of elements in their deck. Um, you'll get to customize it later, but you always start the same way depending on which character you have. The book opens and spawns the curses, and... Each monster has its own spawn effect as well. Oh, that's right, yeah. So when monsters appear, there's text at the bottom of the monster card that says this effect takes place immediately. Generally, pretty bad. Um, sometimes you can get lucky and they have something happen that actually works in your favor if something is... Or doesn't affect you at all. Yeah, yeah, usually that's, that's how it goes. <laughs> but from there, like, it really just becomes... The game becomes an open dialogue. So since everyone's playing with their hands exposed to the table, everyone can see what's laid out on the board, Yeah. It uh, the game immediately launches into conversation of strategizing and what we need to be doing, what each player needs to do on their turn to set up the team for success as you progress through the five steps of, of the game. That initial strategizing is really important because as soon as it's the first player's turn, you only have one turn before you land on your first curse. So you really have to get your team moving efficiently and effectively, which I think is a theme of the game, is, is efficiency, because it really keeps you on a tight time scale, and it's not like you can take your time and level up your characters as you want. The game is always churning forwards, and to win, you have to... Survive. To survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to win at the last one. So if you're not efficient and you're, you're upgrading and customizing, then you're not setting yourself up to win later on. Different ways that you can upgrade yourself uh, and your character throughout the game. Since it is deck building, primarily you're w working to optimize your deck. So what we found to be successful is each character kind of specializing in an element, so you can guarantee, oh, we really need a lot of this element. We're going to go to this person and get them to draw cards and share those cards. So the most common way of upgrading your deck as you progress through the game is when you cure curses. So why don't you explain what happens when any player on the table cures a curse? That by curing a curse, they've collected four of, uh, of a kind, and they're able to remove that curse from the board. And then they get to select a value two um, element card of their choice. And so they're gonna be thinking about how, what is my specialization or what are we really low in as a team right now that it would benefit the team if I took this element. Yeah, and the reason that those higher value cards are so important is because each player's hand is relatively small. Even if you have a really big deck, you're only holding six cards at a time. Yeah. So if they're all val low value one cards, you're not really, you can't, Cure, yeah, you can't cure the curses as efficiently, and like we mentioned, efficiency is 
super important for keeping penalties from piling up. There's... And you have an option for dead cards as well. We haven't really talked about them, but mm -hmm. madness cards, um, which you pick up organically throughout the game every time you um, complete your your deck or you run out of your deck and you have to shuffle, or sometimes they are a penalty at a, at a spawn effect or a curse, they have no value and they take up a slot for you. And if you do end up somehow drawing six <laughs> madness cards, which means you're not doing very well in this game, um, you are dead and you lose. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if that's actually ever happened in all the times that we've played, although we're usually pretty good at seeing the writing on the wall and giving up. <laughs> when games go really poorly, we can definitely... Reset. Yeah, just look at it and be like, okay, we're probably not winning that one. Um, so, yeah, upgrading it, upgrading cards by curing curses, that's the main way, but there, the game does give you access to more varied options than that. So at any time you can kind of spend an equivalent amount of elements to upgrade to that element. So if you had three value one cards, you could turn those in or... Cycle them really, you're putting them on your discard pile. Yeah, you would discard them back into your deck. So you're not getting rid of them, which, you know, kind of keeps your deck diluted, which is something that you have to work towards later. But if you turn in those three value one cards, you can get a value three card in your discard pile as well so that hopefully later on you draw into a higher value card. The other way to upgrade your character is to buy new spells. So part of setting up the game is you make uh, a different spell book of three spells for each element, so a total of 12 spells combined. And there's 36 spells included in the base game. In the game. You kind of shuffle them and choose a random assortment of them every time you set up the game. You have to spend your element cards to buy those spells, so you kind of have to weigh that in your head. Is it worth it to buy the spell, or do I really need to be using these cards to set up the team? Spells are worth it, often, because they're beefed up versions of the four that you start with, and so whether it allows for a higher volume of things that you could do, for example, putting more cards in that shared space, or they call it support in the game, or um, giving more of your uh, peers actions to be able to take so if you do have it if, it if it's possible they can be worth it later on but just like you were saying what's the immediate need that we have as a team yep and much like with the characters i think we found that good spells are not split across the elements as That's well right. so i mean I, I think we never use the fire ones looking back well, I, was gonna really. I was gonna say we never use grass i can't remember the last sands time. of time that's one that we end up with we said yeah so Water spells and air spells are where we spend our, our money. <laughs> yeah, they just seem, at least for our playstyle, I mean, granted, we generally try and use some of the same strategies, so it's possible that we haven't seen the benefits of some of the other opportunity or some of the other abilities that those spells have, but it, I think, balanced just needs to be tweaked a little bit uh, in some areas, spells being one of them. But they, they do add really interesting effects, I will say. Each one definitely feels unique and does something that has its niche moment. You know, sometimes you have that spell that just fits exactly what you need right now, even though that's such a random situation to come up based on all the different moving pieces of the game. As important as upgrading is, you have to find the time to do it. So part of that comes in weighing the risk and reward of certain situations. The game even suggests this in the manual. It says sometimes the best move is to not actively cure curses. Sometimes it's worth it to buy your spells. Sometimes it's worth it to just spend your element cards to upgrade to higher level elements. If you really feel like you can take the penalties in stride and it's not going to ruin the game, then sometimes it is worth it to just ignore them. And that's a really interesting mechanic. And we all the years that we've been playing, I just asked the question the other day, does the game tell you to put the curse card's face up so that you can see the negative effect that's coming? Because I thought, you know, is this something that we've adopted? Does it give you the option? But it actually does. The game instructs you to be able to see what that what you're actually risking. Um, so that analysis is built into the game. I thought that was just how we were playing, but no, no that's, yeah, that's it, it. It wants you to have that informed decision making. You know, if the curses were face down and you couldn't see what was going to happen, then the de facto strategy would be cure everyone because you don't know which everyone ones are every terrible. time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that it it seems like the developers wanted it to be an option to 
weigh the the costs and benefits, which I really like. It, it does reward your ability to think long term in a game that forces you to think short term a lot of the time because the penalties are there. They're happening every time you change change turns. And an interesting opportunity within that is your ability to remember monsters that are coming up. So I, I don't know off the top of my head how many monsters are included in the game, but as you're, you're opening a book, you know, the monster, the current monster is on the left page, and on the right page you can get a hint of what's coming next. You get three, um, three element symbols that uh, describe that monster, so it might be, you know, air, water, fire. So you know, okay, we're gonna have an air, water, and fire curse coming up next time. Yeah, so if you can forego everything that's happening this round and you just want to set yourself up for the next round, especially if you can remember what monster it is and it's something that per is particularly devastating with its spawn effect or um, the penalty for not curing the curses based off that monster, the game does a good job of rewarding your your ability to plan ahead based on your knowledge, which is something that I always look for in a game. I think a game that lets you learn and predict its patterns, I think that's where I find a lot of fun in, in strategizing around that. But I'd say just because you can predict the patterns doesn't mean that multiple playthroughs are going to be exactly the same. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, the game is not solvable by any means just because, you know, you're going to, you shuffle your deck every time you run to the bottom of it. So your draws are going to be different even after your first run through of your deck before you've added any other cards. It, I think it does really strike that balance of predictable if you are able to memorize all the components in the box, but random and there's multiple different systems interacting. So it's definitely not wrote. You don't know what's <laughs> going to happen every time. Not by, not by any means. So the game progresses five rounds in that same way. Monster appears, spawn effect happens, lay out the curses. When you get to, depending on your difficulty, the later rounds, they add in something called, we call it a multi. I don't know what the actual nomenclature is for it in the rulebook or in the game, but it's a curse that has, it's match four is one of each. Type. One, yeah, one of each element. So instead of having to match four of the same element, you have to combine one of each element, which when we have the strategy of specializing usually involves passing turns around the board or being lucky enough to draw, having one player draw into a multi. Uh, but the game, it's actually kind of interesting. The, the end of the game is just the sixth round. When you get to the back of the book, there is an added effect of you put a dead card immediately on top of your deck as a, a boss mechanic, basically so that the next card you draw into is always going to be a madness card, a dead card. But then your win or loss of the game is just can you clear every curse in that last round? If you're you able to win the game, you lose the game. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting that it, winning the game is dependent upon your ability to do the same thing that you've been doing all game. It it rewards your ability to plan to do the game better, but it also feels a little anticlimactic. There's I think. no yeah, there's no final boss, you've entered an arena, and now the stakes are higher. Mm -hmm. If you've set yourself up for success, you're more likely to be successful. So I guess it rewards, like we said the whole time, the planning and the forethought, but it really does not feel like a ring the bell final round. Yeah, especially on games where you, you've really gotten rolling and you can kind of look at the table and look at what's on the board and be like, okay, we have enough cards here to solve all these curses. There's sometimes where we just look at it and say, okay, why even play it out? We we have it in everyone's hand. And that doesn't always feel like a good way to end a game, I suppose. I mean, we could play it through, but then it doesn't feel good that way either because you know that you've won. Whereas if there was a more complex final boss mechanic, that might be a little bit more engaging. So we've talked a little bit about this throughout the episode, but we want to make sure we're cut, we uh, hit what are the main kind of co-op staples of this game? Where are you really interacting with your fellow players at the game? Um, one, of course, is character choice and the combinations that you have. You have up to five players, and so up to five different characters that you can be playing. And so thinking about um, varying the types of skills that they have and the individual decks that they have. Every character starts with, is it 12 total cards? 12 or 16 total cards, but how... I think, it's, I think it's 12. But the balance of those cards are different, so thinking about the ways in which you want to have uh, diversified or not the types of um, character cards that you have at the table is going to impact your game. We talked a little about a bit too earlier that the character abilities aren't as balanced in the game as we would like, but if you have more people at the table, you do have actually a wide, a decently wide um, array to choose from. Yeah, and since our strat we usually use the same characters for our strategy, we basically pull out the characters we know we're going to play, and then we work through 
well, we know we have these. What is everyone else going to play to complement that? So there's still a little bit of choice there. Um, definitely a team decision of what what you're going to choose so that we have a, a well-rounded team. But I would say a lot more of the co-op happens in the actual gameplay itself. And I think that's really highlighted with two of the spells that you have, Ice and Telepathy. Ice is the ability to put cards of your choice in a shared pool, or they call it support, for the game. So everyone being a co-op game can see everyone's individual decks, but I don't have access to Rob's cards because they're in his hand. But if he puts them in support on my turn, I can use those cards. Uh, and so it really allows you to think creatively and truly think as a team because you have a shared pot, honestly, of cards that you can all use at any time. And if ice and support are shared cards, telepathy is shared actions. This is another one of the spells that every player has access to at the beginning. Uh, and this is the ability to, uh, in the midst of your turn, pay to use a spell to give an action to another player. So if you feel like, if I feel like Rob, actually you have the cards to be able to handle this curse that's coming up on my turn and I don't, I can use this to allow you to take that action to save us that time later. Remembering what you said earlier about efficiency and time, the game is always moving forward. Telepathy or telepathizing as our family refers to it, really allows you to take advantage of that. Yeah, I think you see that most often by the player who starts the round because the likelihood that that player also has the ability to cure the first curse just outright with what's in their hand is not not super common so they either have to put cards in support and then pass the baton or telepathize someone to uh, solve the curse if they have it in their hand um, and I think right there you can see if ice is a water spell and telepathy is an air spell those spells are the most cooperative spells, which I think is what shifts the, the power of those elements in the game. That's why we see ice and air being, or water and air being more powerful, is because they give you that opportunity to share things around the board. Yep, whereas um, earth and fire spells are much more for the individual player and their use rather than the table. Yeah, which when every card counts, you can't always be doing things just for yourself. So I think that's why they have that kind of inherent weakness. And as card sharing and action sharing really pile up, there becomes this big opportunity for basically cascading things happening. Yes. So you can send like circles of actions all the way around the table where everyone's sharing cards and you know, I can double telepathize to give you two actions, and one of your actions is telepathize someone else. It creates these really complex chains, which is awesome. It creates this really cool... It's really dynamic. Um, yeah. It's sometimes it's hard to keep up, but you you know good things are happening. Yeah, and it's this really cool puzzle to work through with all the moving pieces and, and opportunities. While all these uh, ability to share actions and, and cards does create this wonderful puzzle, it does also allow for a bit of an alpha player problem, where people who are stronger strategists or can work through the puzzle so many turns ahead can sometimes feel like they are in running the game, basically. If you can find every move the fastest, then you can kind of just point it out to everyone at the table, which leads to a lot of winning, but if the idea is that each person is giving their input or working as a team, sometimes that's not as possible if one person is always first to see the solution. It's not really an inherent detriment uh, to the game, just more something that we become aware of and we would kind of throw it out as a, a word of caution. What's great about um, that type of mechanic is it does bring your strong strategists to the table. So if you've got folks you want to play cooperative games with, maybe they're a little hesitant because they don't feel like they can really live out their, their strategy. Um, this allows them to flex that side of their brain that they love. But it is good when you're running the table to make sure everybody's voice is included. Yeah, and I think by the by the same token, having one person who can see that strategy allows people who maybe aren't as comfortable with strategizing to feel comfortable at the table. It's a table great model well. to watch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that like the game's not going to be too complicated for them because you are working as that team. It's you know the highlight of co-op games is that you can get people who wouldn't want to play because it's too complicated to play because you're all working on a team. No one's going to feel that they're losing just because they're not able to keep up. All that being said, I think overall the game has a relatively low barrier for a pretty strategic game. As long as you can grasp the fundamentals of Match 4, which with Bejeweled and everything like that, all those types of games, a lot of people have that concept of you win by finding these pairs. As long as you have that, you could probably tackle the game on the easiest difficulty. 
as long as you can understand the rules. <laughs> so, from what I've seen, this game is kind of the outlier from this developer. Um, it seems like a lot of their other games are maybe not as intricate, maybe not as complex, and as far as I can tell, not co-op related. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I haven't looked too in-depth, but... I think this game does suffer from maybe like lack of keywords or even outside of that maybe like vague wording throughout the rulebook. So there's some things that, I mean, I know the first time we played, we played completely wrong just because the rulebook was a little hard to understand. So and whenever we play games, Rob's gut and gut feeling or gut interpretation of any rulebook is what would make this harder than it probably is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that's the case, but uh, definitely if there's room for interpretation in a rule, I choose the option that's going to make us lose. Um, Until we go back later and we think, no, we weren't <laughs> supposed to be doing this. Yes. Uh, and if you can wrap your mind around it and get over some of the unclear rules, there's great replayability. I mean, we have not been playing this game for year after year because it's the same every time. I mean, you do, you do get a different puzzle each time, which is great. And though we've really covered a lot of uh, the game so far in terms of a player one and player two, we really feel that this board game works especially well in a larger group. As we mentioned before, this is the first cooperative board game that we played with extended family. Extended family who really had no previous history with cooperative games at all. Um, and it brought a wide range of folks, ages, experience with board games, um, love for competition versus I just want to play a game for fun uh, and, and brought them together. So with all this, um, I would say we absolutely recommend The Big Book of Madness. It is one of our favorites. Um, we do think it works as uh, one and two player, but of course, uh, bring, oh, widen it open to a, a larger circle and take it with some of those flaws that it has. I think there's some room for plenty of room for house rules when it comes <laughs> to The Big Book of Madness that make it worthwhile. Yeah, I think you find the ways to make your own difficulty in it. I know uh, one thing that we've changed is instead of the random spells, sometimes we get we choose the first spell in the deck because there's some that are duds, and why shuffle it each time hoping you get the, the good one when basically you could just forfeit every game and reshuffle the deck. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not a video game where you are beholden to whatever appears on your screen. You can kind of change it around. So... What are what are your key takeaways from this? If you had to highlight like your your biggest pros or your biggest benefits of Big Book of Madness, what would you say? For me, knowing what I like in games, um, obviously visually, uh, really vibrant colors. We talked a little bit about the edgy, uh, almost Hogwarts-like art style. It's a, it's really fun, um, really creative in the way that it's illustrated, and I just find that enjoyable whenever I'm looking at a game, whether that's uh, video or board. Um, but I also appreciate this game because it was my introduction to strategic gaming. It was something I shied away from before at a competitive space, never really felt in my in my element. Ha! In my element. Um, but Ooh, that's bad. <laughs> but um, this really allowed me to get into that type of headspace, especially planning ahead, uh, because I was working on a team. So if either you or your partner uh, is like me and st strategic thinking in terms of gameplay isn't usually your go-to, this is a great one to start bringing you to the table. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if someone in the group is more strategic minded, I think that'll help people kind of develop the strategy. I'm not sure this is one if like a group is trying to break their teeth on strategic gaming, then... Yeah, yeah, you gotta have somebody uh, being more dominant in that in that area, I suppose. Yeah. But what about for you? Um, what stuck out to me when I first found this game on Board Game Geek was that it was cooperative, but also a deck builder. You know, I had thought of deck building as, like, Magic the Gathering or things like that, where it was strictly competitive. So I was really curious how cooperative deck building would work, and I think this game does find really interesting ways to have each person building their deck, but also interacting at the at the same time. So that was just a unique kind of blend of mechanics that I, I hadn't really seen before, and as will continue to be evident as we cover multiple games, I am just puzzle-minded. Uh, having a an optimal solution hidden somewhere in there that you really are, have to work through different systems interacting with each other to find out what's best at any given moment, which is every turn, um, it it speaks to me <laughs> that uh, every, every turn is going to be a new puzzle, I think, um, is what keeps me engaged throughout a game, which isn't very long. It's maybe an hour or so. Yeah, it's definitely, I would say, on the 
medium to shorter end of cooperative board games. Hopefully we'll someday cover some of our longer ones that take more of your day. Yeah. <laughs> One last thing that we do like to cover, in case you do pick this up and it's not a fit for your partner or multiple people in your group, is does it work solo? This game would technically work solo if you are willing to control multiple characters. There is not a one character option, and I don't think that would be very good, because then there's no opportunity to share cards, and half your spells are, are dead. You have one deck at that point. Yeah. Just, yeah. So I don't think it would work that way. I've honestly never tried. It's not explicitly in the rules, and I don't think it would work. If I found you at the table that way, I would think you're very sad. <laughs> well, I mean... With one deck and one character <laughs> yes. by yourself, yes. Yes. I, I will admit to playing by myself with multiple characters recently, uh, just to try and wrap my head around the expansion. I, I mean, our, our first time playing with the expansion, we played, I think, two games. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we brought it home, I, I wanted to play a little bit more and uh, work out how the new systems... Uh, interact with the base game. Um, so if you're willing to play multiple characters or multiple hands by yourself, it does work solo. Probably not the best game if you're looking to pick it up for just solo play, though. And I think that covers it. I don't know. Any other thoughts on Big Book of Madness before we call it quits? Yes. Break it out at your next socially distant family gathering. It's a great one. Yeah, I agree. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to Hours Played. Hopefully we have helped you figure out what to play on your next game night. Uh, if you'd like to know what we have in the works or even suggest a game for us to cover on the show, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at at Hours Played. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for the use of our theme song, BitQuest. You can find more of his music at incompetech.com.